Nikki Roach, and I am honored to be here. I am known for, wow, that's a good question, because I've been asking myself that since I've transitioned out of what I was known for. Um, but to back up just a little bit, I would say it would be my set almost eight years of radio being um, a host and on-air personality and lead producer for the Freeman Bosley Jr. show and the Nick at Nine segment that was yours truly and then I moved on um, to have a very solid sweet 16 years in higher education and in higher education I beyond blessed to advance um, into an administrative role um, where I, I worked um, with an international higher ed institution. And we um, had a blast, I had a blast in this role and uh, learned a lot about myself, a lot about leadership, a lot about the world, um, a lot about what I like, what I don't like and what I wanted out of life. So let's see. <laughs> I am an only child, the most blessed child in the world, um, daughter of uh, Pastor Charles M. Roach, um, who's the pastor of Trinity Mount Carmel. Um, he has gone on before us, um, but his legacy is living on. And I'm, I got the, I got the, the, the mantle right here um, in some ways, not all the ways. And the lovely um, Lady D, so Lady Dolores Roach. Um, and like I said, I'm an only child. Um, most people will frown up and say, oh my gosh, you must be rotten. No, I'm not rotten. I'm just loved, greatly loved. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I'm honored um, beyond measure um, for all that they have provided, they've sacrificed, um, the way that they have not only provided advice in regards to what makes a great life and how to live a God-fearing life, but they demonstrated that, um, not only in public, but also behind the scenes, which allowed me to see the true them, um, as well as to mimic the true them, which I think I'm, I turned out okay. Um, love being a St. Louis native. Um, many people will say, oh my gosh, St. Louis is so small, but I always ask them, where have you traveled lately? And many people will say, uh, and when they have that long pause, I know they've not been too many places, at least not recently. But uh, St. Louis... That I knew that um, there was more for me to, to um, do, more to get done, but it was because of the 911 tragedy that I ended up having a career in radio, <laughs> literally, um, which was absolutely amazing. And I tell people, never doubt that good can come from turbulent times. Um, it's just in those turbulent times that causes things to actually ascend and take flight. So don't run away from those types of things. Before moving to New York, I was working at um, our NBC affiliate in St. Louis, Missouri, and I began to do some special projects in the newsroom because I, my job was an accounting clerk in the business office, but I also did traffic, which is booking the commercials, working with the advertisers. And I began to do some special projects in the newsroom and our community affairs show. And I fell in love with this creative side. And there's a gentleman by the name of Mike Shipley, who was the um, newsroom director at that time. And he came up to the business office to talk to my then boss to tell her that I was definitely in the wrong office, in the wrong part of, of the news station. However, I had no degree and because of that and at this time i'm i'm old because i <laughs> i'm in my you know mid-20s and i but i decided to get a job instead of going to school and i ended up getting um, some extra little spots on tv and some speaking spots and able to do pitch 
pitches for different news stories and they pick them up and I'm like, this is what I need to do. So that's what made me pack up and I quit my job and moved to New York. And at that time I was also, um, cause I married very, very young and that marriage was dissolving, but it allowed me to figure out what I wanted and what did I, what I, what did I want to take a risk on? So I, I took a risk. I had no contacts. I knew nothing. I had no job. I packed up and my parents, they said, go, you can always come back and start over. And so I did that. And it was the best decision I could have ever made. You're taking me way back. So I had not been back. I don't even think it had been a month. And what was happening, there were auditions being held for real entertainment, R-E-E-L entertainment, for the Charter Public Access Station. And the auditions were being held for a host for an entertainment show that would be shown locally. And so she knew that I was somewhat in, into that um, and had a desire and I had already been doing radio. So even though the show, the radio show that I ended up working for um, aired in St. Louis live, I was still on air from New York for a year, at least a year. And so she knew I had this experience with radio and, and with interviewing individuals. So she asked me, and it was a it was boys to men, boys to men. It was a club, <laughs> this adult lounge in University City off of Olive and like North and South. And she says, I need a favor and I need it like today. And so I said, okay, what is it that you need? And she says, I need you to come interview boys to men. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And I, she says, I need you right now. Made my way there and the crazy part about this story, I get there, I see some people that I know, but what happens is we get this dark corner and it's really, really dark, but um, they're like, okay, we've got to proceed. So they're trying to get the lights together. And then my aunt comes over and she's like, I need you to unbutton your shirt. I'm like, what? So I have on this solid white shirt and what's rule number one in, in TV? Don't wear white. So I end up unbuttoning my shirt so she saw I had on the tank top. Do you know she made me take that, that shirt off? At least I had to open it all the way and I'm like, oh my God. And so we do this video, this, this, she sets up the video, I'm getting prepped, but I hear this lady in the background announcing this play called Lord Knows I've Tried in the background and she's trying to get everybody to come out to see it and all this different stuff. And so I'm paying attention to her cause I'm like, this will be a, a great radio interview, but let me get this wrapped up. So I interview Boys to Men and it is a phenomenal experience. And then from that, I'm like bit by this bug to do this entertainment um, interviewing and uh, just to kind of take a, a deeper dive because I, you know, you know how you stick your toe in, but then you're like, nah. Um, but yeah, I go for it. And so I do some more projects with my Aunt Marla. Um, then I also land um, a reoccurring host role in Music Central videos, which is executive produced and the brainchild of Cecil Parker. Then he takes me to another level and I do um, Music Central videos. And then I also do Gospel Expressions. But Gospel Expressions, I'm a PK kid, but I could not get not one artist whether only the ones I would interview, I can get their names right, but the ones I could not get these names right. And the, the one we kept, I kept messing up on was 357. There was a R&B group called 357, but no, it was Trinity 57. So we had to always scrap it. Anyway, I'm, I'm all off right now, but just, just memories, great, great memories. Um, but I do that interview. From the, again, that interview comes this other projects with Cecil Parker and Cecil Parker puts me on the map in regards to hosting these shows that we're in, we're incorporating this community engagement, which again was that passion that I fell in love with from when I was at the TV show. Who knew years later it would come back around and now I'm doing um, live interviews with 
I'm talking such a diverse span of people, nationally known artists, actors, um, community leaders, um, not just from St. Louis. And it, we had a good ride, like, like maybe five or so years. And, but again, remember that lady I mentioned that um, was announcing that play in the background as I'm getting, as I'm preparing to interview Boys to Men, um, if I back up just a little bit, and we have a great interview. She invites me to the play. I see the play. Um, but what's crazy, she calls me after we do that interview. And it's like two weeks before this play is going on the road, a national tour. And she says, I need a favor. <laughs> I get all these calls for favors. Would you be interested in being the lead to this play? I'm like, what? And what's crazy, when I got that call, I was sitting outside the courtroom in St. Louis, Missouri. I had just finalized my divorce. And why does the main character in this play have issues <laughs> with her marriage? So Marty gives me this packet of a script as, with the focus on Tanya who's the main character, and I meet in her living room. We're going through line by line, and she's like, uh-uh. Let me get to know a little bit more about you. So we go down some paths. So I begin to share a few things, and she, you could tell I was getting a little emotional. She said, that right there. I need you to tap right into that, right into that. And so I'm, you know me, I'm, I'm buttoned up, you know. <laughs> I'm all buttoned up. So I'm like, okay, you know. <laughs> so I get all into it. And that launched me into this one and a half year of um, not consistently, but over a time, over that time period of being on the road with this play I had never prepared for. And again, all this stuff is just building off the next. Um, so in this play, we've got Joe Torrey, who is my, who plays my husband in the play. You've got LaShawn Pace with the Pace sisters. You've got Terrell Phillips from Black Street. Um, Sean uh, Levert was my neighbor who looked out for me in the play. And it was just, just massive amount of other talent from St. Louis. Um, many of them are doing great things today. Um, that was a journey. That was an amazing, amazing journey. And so I began to, to do that. And at that time, I also um, had began my career, which I thought I was just going to tap my toe in and tap my toe out in higher ed. So I took, I moved from New York. And at that time, it's like 40000 something a year that I was making to come to work at a university making 18 I think it was making eighty-five. Craziness. So it seemed, but I had a plan because I realized I kept running into these brick walls where I wanted to do certain things. I was being asked to do certain things, but then hitting this roadblock, this this brick wall, because I didn't have a degree. So I had to make some tough decisions. I had to ask myself, what do you want? Um, you can, this, this is cool, but when you have something bubbling up on the inside of you, there is more, you can't ignore that. You can't ignore it. You, you have to lean into it, because if not, it'll mess you up. And I believe that if you don't, you end up dying. A part of you dies. And, so that, that burning, that, that fire within continued to burn. So um, I did go to school. I accepted this entry-level position um, at a higher ed institution. Um, but I, I was still doing the play. But it was so amazing because I would use my vacation time over that, the, the, over that tour for the days that I needed to be gone. I used vacation. And sometimes it was unpaid time. But it allowed me to do both. You make the sacrifices you need to make to make stuff happen. And so I end up um, doing the play. I'm doing radio um, part time. So now that's expanded. Um, I'm, I'm hosting events in St. Louis, concerts. Um, there's Anita Applebaum Entertainment. Um, 
um, hosting all her concert series and then it get bigger and bigger and so we're, she's getting larger venues. Um, and just kind of again, this is building off of still all the different things. So I'm doing the radio, and that led the, the radio interviews led to the plays, led and then the video shows, and so all of it's just like this web. So you talk about who am I and what am I known for and what do I do? It's just this building thing. So this higher ed thing kicks off even more because I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna do this because what I did plan for doing cons hosting, con doing all this stuff. And doing it, as they say, you know, you swagged out <laughs> because it's not it's, it's where you see yourself going, not the point that which you have. And that hustle was real. I didn't realize it, um, but I'm glad I was younger because now I'm like, look, what time? How long is going to be? <laughs> so I end up um, hitting school. I finally get off probation. I mean, I go full fledged, but I'm still working full time. Um, finishing up a bachelor's degree, um, doing radio, hosting events, I mean grinding. Get to the point to where I am about to graduate with this bachelor's degree. So we're talking three and a half to four years later. I'm still in this entry level role, but I've gotten one promotion in this role. I get a call asking if I'm on contract with the radio show because I'm still doing radio on Sundays and also now executive, we're producing the shows, all the shows. And I get a call asking from a competing um, R&B and hip hop radio station in St. Louis and I tell them I'm not on contract. Long story short, I got hired to do a morning show. Did not give my two weeks notice to Webster. Like, yes, talk about timing, hallelujah. This is great. Why did I get a call a couple weeks after? I'm just waiting, because I've already met with them. I've signed a little bit of paperwork, but I didn't do the last part. But I got the offer and I get a call and they mention that we're no longer going that route or with that idea and concept um, because the whole station format has changed. So everybody was let go. When I tell you, I was like, thank you, Jesus. I had not given my two weeks yet. So I end up staying in radio, stayed on my part-time show, my part-time role in radio. And at this point, I'm done with my bachelor's. I graduate. I say, well, let me just apply for another job and hire it. I apply for another job didn't get it, another one that didn't get it, and it was my third one, I didn't get it. And I was like, eh, okay. It was because I volunteered for my boss's boss for a meeting that I end up getting my next role in higher ed, because I volunteered for a project. I volunteer, I get this position um, that I applied for later, and um, so I'm in this role as a coordinator for um, extended campus director. So that's all over the world because this institution has campuses all over the world. It's Webster University. It's my alma mater too. <laughs> so I end up serving in this capacity, but I brought all this wealth of knowledge that I was not aware of to this new, de to this Department of Academic Affairs. They did not understand the business side. So I came in not understanding my value and my worth, but they let me know that. And then I later embraced that and revamp that whole role they hired me for. And what's funny is a lot of people did not um, think I should have taken that position because of the environment. But I've learned you don't allow the environment to depict your um, outlook and your decisions because for me, I shift the environment and the atmospheres when I show up. But I learned that in that lesson. Um, hear what people are saying but don't internalize and digest it until it, you get a chance to make that call. So I get in that role. Within eight months, I'm offered a new position. So I'm not, a, I'm like, are you kidding me? I just started literally eight months. I get um, asked to go and serve as an assistant director and an academic advisor at an extended campus. So I'm running, helping to run a whole university. Get there on my very first day. The director has to take personal leave. I've not even worked one day yet. 
on my first day, he has to leave. And I say, okay. So for a year, I serve as interim director, not only of the campus, but over corporate cohort programs. So I also have three other locations that I'm overseeing. And I don't know nothing about the job, but I figured it out. And this is where leadership comes in. And I didn't realize the level of influence that I possessed and how I can come in and rally up a team and pull out the best in the team. Now the team, honestly, and even if they were sitting <laughs> on my left and my right right now, they would tell you it was quite dysfunctional. But once I left, talking about some rising stars, there are receipts, you hear me? <laughs> and I don't say that boastfully, but I say that to say, you don't know what you have until you are put into a situation to actually exercise what you have and to tap into that. So don't run from situations that are unfamiliar or that are uncomfortable. Actually, those are the things that actually prove who you are because I serve in this capacity um, for the interim director for a year, but then I am the director for another, what, maybe four or five years. My last year in that role was craziness. My whole, my last year was craziness. And all I could say is, God, there is something dynamic that you're about to do and open up. But I began to prepare to leave St. Louis again. So I had an interview and my parents were like, go, try it, give it a, give, give it a try. But I also received a call from the new president because at this time, still at Webster University, we're shifting leadership. And I'm talking all leadership shifts and changes. And so I get this call on this weird day and I'm thinking, oh shoot, I'm gonna get fired because everything that was happening on my campus was going straight to the president. I'm talking long emails. Some I was CC'd in, some I'm not CC'd in the emails in. Sometimes people are calling straight to the president's office, um, to the provost's office, to department of HR. It was just craziness. Dean of students involved, nuts. But what happened, going back to rise to the occasion, you have no idea how you're being set up. I was being set up. And what the phone call was, it was from the president and from the provost, and they said, we've been watching you. And we realize that you have something that we need in our leadership. And of course, you know, I'm like, everything's sweating. Like I'm sweating in places I didn't even know existed. Cause I'm like, I'm gonna get fired. <laughs> oh my Lord. But no, they saw how I was resilient, how I remained professional, how my emotional intelligence shined, how I was able to create community, even in the midst of turbulence. And they offered me a position as an administrator, this position never existed. But they were working on something similar behind the scenes and um, because the student body and faculty members wanted someone to serve in a space that addressed diversity and inclusion, equity, uh, community engagement, um, and a number of different uh, issues that fell under this role. But then I get promoted, I accept the position, I don't move out of St. Louis. Um, but I had to make a decision and I'm like, you know what, I can always move out and take advantage of this opportunity, but to serve as an administrator, youngest person most of the time at the table, only female, and um, oftentimes the only person of color. We don't even have time to talk about my level of imposter syndrome that I suffered from. Um, all these years and all those years, but I kept grinding, kept learning, kept stretching myself, but still internally warring with myself. Like, do I really deserve this? God, really? All the way through to the end almost, except no, to my, I say three years in. Cause my first year I was in place, I'm gonna be honest, because I was still processing what has happened. And what happens is I noticed that um, people will say there are so few women of color that are in leadership. That is true. But so many women of color are also going through that revolving door. We're getting on and we are hopping off. 
women of color, specifically black women, African-American women, are number one for starting businesses. They are totally surpassing all other races and the other gender um, in regards to starting businesses that they are owners, the owners of because they get to the point to where it's enough. Enough, like, oh my gosh. I need it, I don't regret anything because now I have been that one to jump out of that revolving door at this season in my life. And it's not so much that I was unfulfilled, no. I jumped out of this revolving door and people are still asking me, okay, you gotta be smoking something because you arrived. But there is no arrival, it's a journey. And you have to understand that while I would not take back anything, and honestly, I would go back if I didn't have, remember that fire that I said that, was, that burns, something was burning, and, but I needed this experience to feel imposter syndrome, to feel lonely, to work seven days a week, all day. I'm taking work home. I'm, I'm staying at work when everybody else is gone. I'm um, mediating 